So yeah, thanks for picking this session. We're going to learn a lot about everyone's favorite topic, governance. It's super exciting. Um, it's a big part of, of how we do things at Capital One, and probably you're going to learn uh, it's important to your, wherever you're working, whatever your role is as well. Um, so as Eric mentioned, I was at, at, on the DA team and as an SA at AWS for about six years, primarily focused on serverless and event-driven architectures, and joined Capital One about a year ago as a senior distinguished engineer, also focused on serverless and event-driven architecture. Capital One is a big AWS customer and um, you know, fully bought into this uh, idea of serverless adoption and kind of moving, maturing architectures in this space. Um, outside of that, I also work in resiliency. So you can imagine that at a financial organization, that's a big part of our business and thinking about things like multi-region architectures and having resiliency across complex systems like a pinch driven architectures comes up a lot when talking with engineering teams. They understand what they want to build, but not how to build it in a resilient way. Um, and we'll see about how we, when we introduce EDAs, how that um, kind of pushes on uh, concepts of governance and makes them more challenging in some ways and how we can address that. Um, and then, of course, a big part of this is around the developer experience, right? So as primarily working with engineers, engineers want to write code and ship code and the, their experience around building and doing that, not only just in the authoring and delivery of code, but also observability and troubleshooting, all these things kind of come into play when we talk about EDA. So that's my full-time job. My part-time job is doing fun things like this with my kids. So a couple of weeks ago, um, I built a uh, a soapbox derby car with my neighbor and our two sons, and we had a blast. Um, and it's funny, as we were doing this, concepts of governance were coming in uh, to play. We, of course, we started out with this grand idea, look, think how cool this car is going to look, and it's going to be the, you know, the neatest thing. You see all these cool pictures of soapbox derby cars. Um, and then ultimately, like this is kind of what we <laughs> ended up shipping, uh, which does not look very cool. But what we ended up flipping our focus to was uh, we're going to put our 10-year-old boys in this thing and push them down a hill, maybe we should make sure it's safe <laughs> and that you know, they're not going to die and get seriously hurt. So we kind of pivoted our focus and it's kind of brought up a lot of these concepts of governance, like how can we put guardrails around things to make them safe to use when our goal is to move fast. Kids want to go fast, that's kind of part of the goal, but we need to do it in a safe way. And um, this is kind of, I think, encapsulates sort of our, our challenges and, and sort of excitement. You can see how excited I am about governing this uh, soapbox derby with the car down. So we did not win on speed or style, um, but it was a blast and we'll be next year. We'll be back next year with um, some innovations. So this is the agenda for the talk. We're gonna talk about each of these boxes and sort of their interactions between each other. Um, it's a bit abstract on sort of the technology we're using. It should be portable to your organization and you know, the technology that you might be using but it kind of captures some of the lessons learned um, that I've seen in Capital One and working with other large enterprise customers, although they're applicable to you in smaller environments as well. So of course, Canva EDA talk with a very brief introduction to it. Um, so of course, especially as I'm working with a lot of engineers, a lot of engineers are coming from more of an API driven mindset, right? They understand how to build code and ship it in a very synchronous request response uh, interaction with uh, their uh, dependencies. And you can see we start off, it's very easy. You can see the producer here is just like crushing it, right, with his weights, it's simple to do. Um, and we're gonna kind of talk about how things get more complex, but it's really important to recognize what works well in these uh, environments. It's very simple, right? There's low latency, there's not a lot of intermediaries involved. It's very easy to, to govern and troubleshoot, get observability in what's going on. So we'll see like as we kind of make things more distributed and decouple things, we still need those aspects of our architecture to be covered but it gets harder to do it as things become more decoupled. So um, there's some lessons learned we can take from asynchronous communication and, and the benefits we get from it and look to see how we can apply those to more decoupled architectures. Um, but of course, there's challenges as well, right? There's a reason why we don't build large-scale synchronous uh, systems because they're brittle over time, right? Consumers can fail, right, impacting producers. We can have asymmetric uh, scaling issues, right? The producers can produce more events than the consumers can handle based on their scaling abilities. And this problem just becomes worse over time. So our producer kind of just starts suffering from this, especially when we're dealing with point-to-point -point, uh, synchronous communication. Um, the producer is now responsible for more uh, routing decisions based on business logic. It has to track uh, consumers as they come and go, right? So the responsibility of the producer keeps growing. And of course, as we add many, many consumers, especially in large organizations, as James was talking about, you know, very large uh, enterprises are essentially 
multiple small companies and working independently on the divisions that have to integrate with each other. So it's a really good microcosm for sort of the, the themes that James was talking about with flow architectures and the world we want to move to where we can more freely um, exchange data across different uh, organizational boundaries. So of course, what do we do to address this? We um, in, in introduce an intermediary, like a router, that we can move the responsibility of that routing logic away from the producer and we decouple the system and we give it more flexibility so that producers can send messages or events to the router and then consumers are free to come and subscribe to the events that they're interested um, in doing. And, and James talked a lot about the different mechanisms and protocols to do that. But essentially you're trying to decouple the system and empower these two separate entities to be able to innovate independently of each other um, in order to drive you know, larger innovation and features for your organization. Now, in this case, the producer's job is simpler, right? Now he's crushing it again with the, the weights. Um, it's really important in this case that the producer is including enough context in the message or the event that they're publishing so that the consumers can have enough information that they want uh, to pick the events that are important to them in their context. Um, however, we now have more boxes and arrows in this architecture, right? So the trade-off here, we have the benefits are, we have a more flexible architecture that is more flexible it's more decoupled, can change over time. Um, however, we have more, we've, we've moved the producers and consumers further apart. So getting visibility and, and asking these governance questions becomes more challenging. And of course, this gets even more challenging as we introduce more types of intermediaries. You know, James was talking about the different types of technology we can use for workflows and streams and queues. Um, all of those types of things come into play. But as we add more components, then we get the benefits of further decoupling, but the challenges of kind of tying together the larger picture across these systems. So why do we need governance? Well, we need governance because it really is this balance between agility and risk, right? So if we go back to my soapbox derby car example, right? So uh, the kids want to go fast, right? We want to go to market fast. We want to innovate. We want to create new things on behalf of our customers. Um, I want them to do that, but I also want them not to die. And so we want to introduce guardrails and controls so that we can have safety. So in the soapbox curvy car, for example, those were brakes, right? So that you could stop and it was steering, right? And, and very stable steering. And in fact, it didn't allow them to oversteer, right? So you, you can imagine kids will overreact and maybe oversteer and flip the car, right? So you in, introduce things like stop blocks on the steering so that you have limited steering that you can do, right? So there's all these sort of techniques that you can do that, that doesn't, it's, they're not uh, an emergency brake on the car, they're not preventing the car from going down the hill, but they have some control on what flexibility that the car can, can uh, you know, maneuver going down the hill. Um, and so the other interesting thing about governance is it's not an end goal, so you don't, you know, analyze your, your organization, your current requirements and say, okay, this is our governance strategy. Let's, we're done. Like, we'll do that and we'll be good. So the challenge is that, you know, your organization is always changing, right? You could be growing or shrinking. You could be reorganizing into different divisions, you know, consolidating, splitting up the technology you use, your competition, the market, all of these things are constantly going to be changing. Um, and what that does is it's constantly unbalancing this balance, right? You will over-index in different directions as you go based on what that change in technology is. So maybe it's something like GDPR all of a sudden becomes a thing um, and your organization has to reckon with that. So that is going to push you more into the control side where now you have to introduce more guardrails that help you guard you know, GDPR and uh, data sovereignty and those types of things. But all, you know, eventually over time you develop mechanisms that you know, will balance those controls that you need with self-service innovation that developers can use to achieve those goals, but do it in a quick way that doesn't impede their, um, their speed to market. So this idea of governments and balance is constantly in question and constantly under analysis. You're never really done with this analysis. And it's kind of what makes it challenging, but also kind of fun in finding the right balance, the right implementations and combinations of tools to make both sides happy. Essentially, you want to make developers happy and, and what they're pushing, but you also need you know, some, some reason and auditability in your, in your organization. So we think about our EDA architecture, we do need governance at all levels. So we think of our infrastructure level. Um, if this is in AWS, right, you're thinking about your account governance, your AWS accounts, things like AWS organizations, service control policies, your authentication and authorization, like all of these sort of basics, that needs to be in place and be solid before we can build on top of it. 
Aid West offers things like Control Tower, and you know, as they've moved more and more into enterprise, they've recognized they need more tooling and help, <clears throat> excuse me, engineers to be able to achieve those goals more simply and quickly, right? So that's kind of table stakes. We have to have a well-governed um, infrastructure layer. <clears throat> excuse me. And then EDA, we're gonna build on top of that. So we keep moving up the stack. You know, EDA, we're doing you know, asynchronous message processing. And so we have another layer of governance to think about. So we have those channels that those are flowing across. It's not just the infrastructure, whether those are AWS native services or your own open source software running in EC, um, EC2 or, or containers or whatnot. Um, but it's the sort of channels that we're creating, the streams and queues and topics and buses. Those are sort of the next layer of infrastructure, logical infrastructure that the messengers are gonna flow across. And so for those, we need to think about what, is, what are the things that are particular to that that need to be governed as well. So it could be the um, server-side encryption requirements of the data that's flowing across those channels. It could be the use of dead letter queues, for example, recognizing that um, events can get lost in different channels and we need to anticipate that. Um, it could be the, the scaling behaviors of these different services, right? Or the delivery semantics, right? It, or is the channel that we're connecting with at least once delivery? Is it exactly once delivery? Is it most once delivery? These are the types of kind of higher level concepts that we're adding to our, our architecture that need to have a point of view and governance controls around it, right? Of course, move up higher, right? So, you know, events are really giving meaning. They're the semantics that sit on top of messages. We're using messages to transmit the events across our architecture, but there's meaning to those events. So now we need to think about what governance is required at the event level, and what are we adding to that outside of the channels? And that type of governance really is based on metadata. That's what we're gonna talk a lot about is how metadata influences this. So when we really think about governance and event-driven architecture, we're really talking about data governance and metadata governance. And this concept around metadata and data governance isn't specific to event-driven architectures. If you have any sort of data engineering and analytics groups, AI, ML, all of those things are gonna be underpinned by the same type of, of governance. But it's particularly important as we're looking at scaling events across an organization. We need this as sort of the core information that allows us to build on top of it. Okay, so let's do a survey. Um, in, this, in this architecture, we're talking about producers and consumers. Uh, who thinks the producers are responsible for governance? Okay, Adam, thank you, yes. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, who thinks the consumers are responsible for it? <laughs> Adam, too. Okay, who thinks this is a trick question and actually both are required? Okay, guys, okay, I couldn't outsmart you guys. So. Um, yeah, of course, right? So, you know, we, I love this term from AWS uses around shared responsibility model. It's kind of like a thing that you could apply to almost any aspects of architecture. Um, but I think it really represents well what's required in, in distributed and decoupled systems, right? It is not the responsibility of any of these parties to ensure that you have an overall well-governed system. You need everyone to participate in that. And it's not just at the event level, right? As we move, move down all those architectural levels, it requires the participation of security groups, right? Platform teams, um, uh, you know, uh, engineering, product. Everyone has to participate together in order to ensure that we have well-governed systems. Okay, so as I mentioned, when we're thinking about EDA governance, it really all starts with this metadata catalog. It sort of underpins everything that we need um, to build on top of. So we're gonna kind of build out that agenda slide that I mentioned initially. So of course we have our producers and a router and consumer, sort of our basic EDA architecture, and we're gonna add this metadata catalog. Now, there's some common functionality for a metadata catalog. Um, James had mentioned as well, discoverability is a big one, right? In large organizations, often um, people are dealing, they're exploring a problem space. They have a problem to solve, but they don't really know what information they need or what's available. So as James was mentioning, using Google to search for APIs, I do this all the time, right? I search for, I, I have an idea of the thing I'm interested in. I'll type in some terms, right? It's not quite right, I'll read a blog, I'll find some more exact terminology around I want, and I sort of like zero in on the thing that I need over time. So this challenge of discoverability is very important inside of a large organization where there can be a lot of common information that has really important distinctions and it's really critical that you can distinguish between similar types of events and metadata in order to locate the type of event that you want to react to to solve your use case. So once we can discover the event we want, it's important that there's technical information about that. What is the schema and the sort of technical details and how you're gonna consume the event? Um, 
but it's really critical that we can understand the business context around that event. So it's not just the technical details and what's coming in the, what's, what are the data in the event, but we need to apply business context to that, right? So in, in certain um, use cases, right, there can be really nuanced distingu uh, distinguishing properties about events, and those need to be clearly called out so that people can be confident, not just discovering their events, but using them appropriately. And then last is the usability of it. So the data catalog can also act as a portal. So once you've discovered the event, there can be information about how a developer can easily use that. So it could be schema information, right? It could be documentation. Um, it could be endpoints, right, in order to subscribe to those and consume those events. And better yet, there could be clients that you could download in order to make it easy for people to connect to those sources, right? So we're really, this is a single place that we want people to come to when they're going through all phases of uh, you know, discovering and using the metadata. Um, so the, we have this catalog, we need to put information in it, and that's the responsibility of the producer in order to register those schemas with the catalog, the metadata with the catalog. Now it might not be only the producer's responsibility. So you can imagine in large organizations, you know, just like we're uh, reviewing code, is there can be opportunity for people to have visibility and, and feedback on the schemas that are getting registered in a metadata catalog and approved. So it doesn't mean that this is a totally self-service operation, but ultimately the producer is responsible for publishing the message in the schema, and, and so I view them as sort of the primary responsible um, entity for registering the schemas in the metadata catalog. Now, oftentimes, when I've seen examples of metadata catalogs, and, um, it, it's like the end of the road. There are these beautiful like examples, and they come with a bow on them, and the, the domain is very well defined, the properties are really defined, it's just a, it's a very, not as simple, but a very clear case for what a good looks like for metadata. Um, but I will tell you, that is not how things start. <laughs> things start in a very raw way, um, oftentimes, you're, you're, you could be integrating with a third party who's providing you data, um, uh, and you go through this discovery phase. So the data may be incomplete, it may be confusing, there may not be enough context around the data that you're receiving. So there's a lot of um, an early stage sort of phase of metadata. Now, it's still, um, so an example of that might be coffee beans, right? So if we're gonna, in our example, we're gonna talk about how we can build um, systems around metadata and coffee. So we might start off, these are, these are very, these are just oval shapes, right? They could be coffee beans, they could be, you know, flying saucers, you know what. But um, we have sort of an indistinct shape of the thing that we're dealing with. And we might have some just very simple fields, the species of the coffee, the company that produced it, the country of origin. So we have some information around them. And the quality of this data could be very low as well. Maybe we have some technical fields and some example values, but there's just a lot, a lot of meat there in order to process. Um, it's still valuable, though, to register data in a catalog, even when it's in this raw form. Again, the metadata catalog is the single place that we're storing these things and discovering them and interacting with them. So even in a raw form, it's still useful to have it in the catalog. You may only have it in the catalog for a limited period of time. But another thing you can use is you can use the quality of the metadata to limit its use in the organization. So here we've registered the raw, the discovered schemas in the metadata catalog, but notice that that's the only place that you can use it. We don't allow publisher, producers to publish messages with the schema. We don't allow consumers to consume it in the same bounded context of the producer or in other bounded context. So we're kind of letting it out a little bit, but we're not really introducing it to the larger organization. You can't really use it. The blast radius is kind of small for um, its, its kind of rawness of the data. So the next phase we might move into is something called a documented phase. The documented phase is where we're gonna put energy into filling out the information. So not only do we have technical information, but now we're gonna start adding business context to that. So instead of a technical field name, you might add a business field name. What is, what is the description, I'm sorry, the, the naming of these fields based on the ubiquitous language in your organization? The things that would make sense to people that are trying to find these things, right? Because the technical field names could be abbreviated, they can come in a lot of varieties that may not um, be clear on what they are and how they're used, and especially if someone's new to the problem space, they might not have the domain context to understand what they're looking at. So the documented phase gives you that opportunity to do that. So the business names are very important, but also very detailed descriptions. Um, and so you can have sort of a quality gate around this where people are reviewing the metadata and ensuring that descriptions are, are detailed enough that explains what the fields are and any differences, nuances in those field values 
compared to other field values. So in a lot of cases, you can find metadata fields that are very similar but have different meaning in different contexts. And this is really where you want to tease that out. Um, and it can it definitely is a conversation, right, with your, uh, you know, not just the producer deciding what these things are, but getting feedback from others in the organization and sort of going through a review and approval process to ensure you've got the right context captured from a business perspective. So here we have our, our beans. Now our beans have little lines in them. This looks a little bit more like a coffee bean. Um, and we've added more information. So now we know the farm those beans are coming from. We know the lot number of the order. So if we wanted to trace those beans back to a particular shipment, we could do that. We might even know the mill of uh, the, where the, the coffee beans were, were milled before being shipped. So not only do we have more metadata fields, more information, but we also have more detail on those, right? So we have the business names and the business descriptions as well. So we're rounding out what's going on. Um, and as we do that, that gives us, uh, we can open up the usage of that a little bit more. So now, not only can that metadata live in the catalog, but now we allow uh, producers to publish events using that metadata and those schemas. Um, however, we're limiting who can use that. So now we might view that in sort of this phase as only being used as internal business events towards a, a bounded context. So here, only consumers in the same bounded context can subscribe to those events and use them, right? So we're, you know, this might be useful in the case that you have engineers that are starting to build applications around these um, things. You might be getting feedback on their usage. So we still want to kind of expand its use, but not totally let it go um, everywhere. So sort of the final phase that you might think about with metadata quality is the curated phase. A curated phase means that not only do we have the technical and the business context, is that we've added classifications and qualifications to the metadata as well. So this might be whether the, um, you know, the fields are required or not, um, but it can also be more business context classifications. So whether the information in this field um, requires encryption or not, what it is, whether it's public-private information, some rules around how it can be published or consumed. So this is um, additional, uh, very um, qualitative or categorical information about it that really gives us the full context on the metadata and how it can be used across the organization. So now we, our beans are brown and they've got lines. We really know that these, these look a lot like coffee beans right now. Um, but uh, we've added a little bit more information. Contact information, right, which might be like sensitive information about a particular um, supplier, which may not be, you know, something that you want to share out broadly. Um, and maybe something like carbon emissions, right? We know as organizations, boards are now interested in their suppliers and their carbon emissions. And so um, for our company, we might want to be able to report that up to our board. And this might be very sensitive information, according to the supplier, that is not widely available, right? So we're adding more and more fields, but the fields that we're adding at a certain point require this curated information around them to make them usable across the organization in a well-governed and responsible way. So once we move to the curated phase, now you can see we really have no restrictions on it use across um, the organization. So it can be used um, within the same bounded context as the producer, but it can be used in other bounded contexts as well. So now we feel like we have enough in, uh, metadata and detailed metadata that we can then reason about um, how it's being used across the organization. That's really the goal. Um, okay, so, um, uh, so, sorry. Um, okay, so this decision on what's in our metadata, kind of like our governance, it doesn't, it doesn't end when you've created the schema the first time. We're gonna evolve these, this metadata over time. Um, and there's a couple of considerations for that. First is um, when we have breaking changes to schemas and metadata, those are backwards incompatible changes, these are, uh, com they add complexity to the overall system and they increase cost, but from a labor and a time perspective. So this concept, I think, on backwards compatibility is, is well understood and, and accepted when we're thinking about API-driven architectures, right? APIs have interfaces, right, well-defined, you know, request structures and body structures and responses. Um, and there's, you know, it, it's easily for people to understand, I think, what the impact of those are because the impact happens in one place. If you version a, a, uh, an API in a way that's backwards and compatible, it happens in one place. You can see that, you can reason about it, you can kind of you wrap your brain around it. Um, but I think when we kind of talk about schemas being backwards compatible, it's, for some reason, it's not as easy for people to wrap their brains around. And I think it's because that's that contract that you put into the schema, 
and it's trust that people put in it, it's portable. It moves along with that data. You kind of, you lose, you lose it, right? Once we publish events, they're kind of out there for people to consume. Um, but I think, if anything, that makes that schema backwards compatibility more important, right? Because we don't have a central place that we can control it. We have to further invest and double down on this backwards compatibility. Um, and when we do that, it has some benefits, right? So it builds trust in the overall system of events. So developers can subscribe to events and process them without fear that, uh, you know, they're gonna be woken up next week in the middle of the night being paged because some other person made a change to the data that they didn't know about and it's gonna break their system, right? So, um, you know, having backwards compatibility is a big part of earning trust in, in the overall system and it increases stability, right? So benefits are we've, we've decoupled the system, you know, things are much more flexible, it's really cool, but um, we've also introduced architectural complexity in the organization, right, which can inc introduce instability based on all the different moving you know, boxes and arrows and moving of parts. So where we can simplify things and create standardizations and trust is important to, um, you know, to feed into a greater overall stability of the whole system. Now as you're doing this, there's a couple of techniques that you can consider. So one is considering default values. So as, you're, you know, as we evolve a schema in a backwards compatible way, we're going to introduce new fields, but we might have producers and consumers that are interacting with that schema at different versions at the same time. It's not gonna be an atomic flip to a new version. So in the case where we've created a new version that we want consumers to consume, um, producers that are, are producing events at the older version, we can, we can decouple sort of the versions of those things by using default values. So the consumer can consume a different version and not be impacted if the event hasn't been created by a producer at, at that schema version. Um, same goes true when you deprecate fields, right? We don't want to delete fields out of the schema. That could, be, um, that could break our different consumers. So we might introduce a default value for deprecated fields as well. So if it's no longer being published by producers, then we can give a default value that people can, can reason about. So another uh, thing I've seen is it's very tempting inside of our metadata schemas to um, know, like we have the known knowns about the universe that we're working in and our domain, and it's, it's tempting to be able to model those as enumerations. So we might say like uh, there's only, we have north, south, east, and west of directions in our use case, and that will never change, so we're gonna keep those. Um, and then we learn, you know, of course, the, as soon as you make a decision like that, that's exactly always when it happens, where you learn the next week that, nope, the business requirements are changing. Uh, now we have northeast, northwest. We have different types of variations on those things. So the, the risk of, um, so the benefit, right, of enumerations is, is it makes, it's very clear on what the values can be in those set of values, right? So that's a better developer experience. Um, the risk, though, is that it can impact backwards compatibility over time. So I really recommend limiting the use of these. Um, you can more better represent these as types, right? So if you have a string type um, or a, a Boolean type, for example, but then you're gonna, we'll see later where you can need to be able to check these values in different ways later on anyway. So it doesn't really help you there. So the other two things to consider is once we are evolving our schemas is we need to be able to observe the versions that are used. So Ultimately, we'll look at how governance enables um, a, a observability and analytics. That's really crit critical for us to be able to see what's going on in the overall system and push people up to newer schema versions or reason about their support over time. Supporting multiple versions of schemas over time can become costly, so there's a couple of strategies for this. One is that you can limit, of course, the number of versions that you want to support. So you might do like an N minus two approach where you support the current version and two previous versions. Um, this is easier on, on, some, on the producer side. They're not having to produce as many versions of the events, um, but it puts a lot of work on the consumers to be constantly upgrading those. It can also prevent you from launching new versions of schemas until you've upgraded people to a, a sort of the middle version so that you can move up a version as you go. Um, so that's one way you can look at it. Another way I like is um, Stripe's uh, API schema approach for this, where they have new customers pinned to a, the newest version of the schema at that time. So customers are always pinned to a version. <clears throat> um, and then they give customers the option of requesting a newer version when they um, you know, request information so they can test new versions of schemas proactively before pinning it to the new version. Um, so I like this strategy. The other thing is that they only publish events at the newest schema version. 
So it's not as hard for the publisher, and then they have a downcasting system. So you publish an event always at the newest, and then if required by a particular consumer, consumer you can essentially have migrations that will uh, transform the events to lower levels as needed. But the idea there is over time, you're, you're getting new customers at the new version, so you have a longer tail that the, the, the need to do those downcastings is reduced over time. So there's a natural kind of reduction of that work instead of always having to upcast to the latest version based on the producer producing at a smaller version. So these are some different things that you can think about, but this is going to happen. It's important to think about what your evolution of your metadata is going to be. It's another thing that will happen in your organization and you don't want to get caught flat-footed. Okay, so we've talked about the metadata catalog and sort of how we evolve it. Um, the next challenge you might run into, especially in large organizations, is um, that you will get some sprawl on the types of data that you're working with. So if we have something like coffee species, for example, you know, the type of coffee we're getting, um, how we describe what that coffee species is can vary in a lot of subtle and, and annoying ways, right? So we're dealing with different suppliers and how they describe these events and the data in them. They can vary basically on syntax. They can vary on semantics, right? The different things that they call them that are the same things. Um, and then what can happen though is without sort of a, an opinion on this, is over time this will create sprawl. So you'll end up with lots of different variations on similar types of events. And in large organizations, this can really grow quite large. And all of a sudden you have a catalog with you know, hundreds of thousands of events. And now the discovery of the correct event to use becomes really difficult because things start to look very similar to each other. So the metadata dictionary is a way of standardizing on the ubiquitous language for your organization and what you agree for your most popular domain objects, what are the fields meant to be called, and we can map to those in order to create a standardization. So we're pushing the work up to the producer so that it's easier for all the consumers to be able to use the same data. So you can apply this you know, standardization, right? Not just to the field names, but also to field values. Let's say we're dealing with a telephone number, for example. We can standardize on how we're gonna format telephone numbers earlier in the system to make it easier for everyone to consume the same thing. Um, now, the place that we plug this in is when we register the schemas in the metadata catalog. So if I'm a, a producer and I want to register a new schema, that process, depending on what I'm registering, may suggest or require me to opt in or opt out of certain standard fields, right? So there's, it's easier for me to discover what those standard fields are and specify a mapping to them or explicitly opt out of those fields if I don't need them. Right, so this is the point where we want to reference the metadata dictionary and, and put it in the registration process up front. So that only happens once and early on and then everyone gets the benefit um, moving past that. Cool. Um, okay, so we kind of have our underpinnings here, the metadata information. Now we want to figure out how we're going to use this. So of course, we start out, we have a, a producer that's publishing events to a router. And uh, as it's on the back of your t-shirts, right, you'll see that events really are composed of two main things. We've got the metadata of the event and the data in the payload. And here's an example of what that might look like. Um, so in the metadata, we're gonna store fields and values here that are applicable across the whole organization and are useful for security and logging and analytics and observability, all these things that are common across those. Typically you'll see things like a type, you know, and, and uh, James had mentioned cloud events, I think is a good place to look at what some of these standards are. So we have a type, a lot of times for the value of the type of event, I'll see a dotted format like this where we have the domain or the bounded context followed by the event name. Um, as you've probably heard before, right, there's, it's nice to have a convention around event names to use a, ver a noun in a past tense verb. It's kind of a nice convention. It reinforces the fact that events occur in the past and they're immutable um, and they can't be changed. Um, however, this is really up to you what you'd like to name it. And then often the source of those events, right? So again, sort of the domain or the bounded context where those events are coming from, the time that the event was published. Um, and then this is where the schemas are gonna come into play. So um, you'll often you know, have a field for the data schema. The value for that field is often a, a URL to where that schema resides. That's usually in the metadata catalog so that you can go to that and pull the schema value. Um, and then we'll have the data schema version um, as well. So that's important to note. Sometimes the data schema version is part of the URL. Sometimes the URL for the data schema 
doesn't, ha doesn't mirror the type name. Maybe it's a GUID that has stored the ID. So the URLs are really meant to be opaque, right? We're not really meant to parse that URL. We're just supposed to follow that URL in order to get the schema to use. Um, so it, it can work both ways based on how you are, what catalog you're using and how it's organized. It doesn't matter. But you do want to make sure that the schema version is represented somewhere in the, the reference to the, the data schema. Um, and then lastly, we'll have sort of uh, ubiquitous types of fields like item potency tokens, right, for deduplication. You might have a sequence ID. Um, that's another popular thing to put in here. So what are the fields that are needed across event types regardless of their payload? Of course, in the data payload side, this is whatever maps to the schema, right? What is the data that can be validated with the schema and, and maps to the type of the event? So here we have the company name, the coffee species, and the country of origin for the coffee. Um, and that's going to map to our bean registered event that we're trying to, to validate. So we want to make it easy for all publishers and organizations to follow these standards. So one way we can do that is have an application library, right, across different languages that makes it easy to publish events. So here we have a, a Java example, and in this case we have, we have a library, right, which gives us a publisher client. The publisher client knows where to publish events to, right, how to create the right um, structure of the request, right, how to serialize the data, is it JSON data, Avro schema, or whatever that's kind of going to the endpoint. Um, and then we have the ability to model the request and the response. So here we have a request builder, and in the request builder, this gives us typed properties that can be required in order to publish that event. So it makes it very easy for a developer to know what are the fields that I need to put in and what those values are in a consistent way. Um, it also provides flexibility, though, so the data attribute of this request can be just take an object of any type. So it doesn't, it doesn't require a knowledge. It can work across event types and just provide a standard way of publishing them. Um, so having these types of application libraries is really critical to kind of get well-governed and consistent results across large organizations with lots of engineers. Okay, so... Um, we have this, you know, really well-formed event now that's going to the router, um, but how do we know that these events are valid, right? It's possible that the router could validate those events, but that's, that capability is not in all routing of events, right? So we need a capability to do the validation um, before it gets to the router. So here we want to introduce a gateway. Now, again, the gateway may be part of the routing or it may be external to it. I've seen it both ways. Um, but this is a, the functionality where we're going to publish the event to the gateway, and the gateway is going to validate the schema against um, the event and then forward it to the router if it's valid for processing. Now, there's a couple of common things that you want to do in a producer validator. The producer validator is all about control. We're really having, you know, we think about this command control. We're really coming heavy on enforcement at the producer side. And the reason we want to do that is because we want to prevent bad structured events from getting into the system and then it grows in cost and complexity as it moves through the system. So we're being tougher on the events that get into the system, right? And there's a couple of way, things that we'll check. So we'll check the formatting of the event, although we have this nice, nice like application library you can use. Maybe not everyone uses that, so we need to ensure that the events are coming in the right formats. We need to validate the schemas, right, that are attached to the event to ensure they're correct. And in some cases, um, the schema may not be able to represent all aspects of validation. So let's say we have a completeness requirement where we have a, a field that can take an array of items, but we know that we need at least two items, right? Maybe this is in you know, a list of subnets or something like that for an AWS environment or something like that. Um, so the va producer validation also wants to check on completeness. It might need additional logic to do that, but that's also a critical a control point before we publish events. So here's an example a curl statement that we might do that. We do it against the gateway, you see, and we're posting the event structure as we talked about before. But notice this time I've forgotten to include the country of origin. Um, and then we will see 400 responses from the gateway. So we tell us it's a client error, and then the, it's up to the producer to fix this problem and resubmit, or to notify its um, upstream dependencies that the data is incorrect. Um, so there's lots of different ways that it can signal back that needs something needs to change, but it's up to the producer to correct this problem and retry. Cool. So um, now we've got valid events going to the router, um, and we want to be able to use those, right, in organization. So the first thing the consumer needs to do is discover these events, 
Now, what's interesting about this, especially in, in large organizations where we're kind of exploring the unknown unknowns in a, in a problem space, is the, the questions that people are asking of these events are very domain focused. People are not asking the technical details of information. They come from a problem they're trying to solve, a use case they have, a question they have. So, you know, when are the new coffee beans registered or when are coffee beans delivered? Like these are like business problems that they're asking um, of the, the uh, metadata catalog to discover the events they want to use. So it's really critical that the metadata in the catalog is complete, right? Back to that high quality metadata is really critical in order to just drive discovery. Um, it needs to be detailed. Um, and lastly, it needs to be intuitive. So it needs to be in the language of the business so that it easily matches up with the types of business questions that are being asked, right? It's really critical that we kind of uh, have things that are discoverable in, this, in, the, in the very similar way that people are gonna ask those questions. Now we can help discovery though. It doesn't have to be all on the person to be able to find these things. We can aid them in that. So we can, based on the usage of the catalog, so we can look at how people are using it, tracking history of those things. We can track which events are being subscribed to or produced so we can look at the actual traffic of those systems. We can take all of this data and we can use it to drive um, assistance back to metadata discovery. So this could be around what's popular. So someone's coming to the, you know, the metadata registry and they, they search for coffee. You know, what, is the, what is the most used event right, that people are using? That might be the one they want. So that's an easy way to get people to the right suggestion. Um, if they're looking at a particular event, we can uh, show similar types of events that people are using. So it may not be the one, but they might not be aware that there's an event that is, is slightly different, but captures their use case better. So that's an easy way they can see those. Or we can use this to drive models, right? So we can take all this data, create AI models, um, and use them to drive recommendations and predictions as well. So there's a lot of things that we can add to the discovery process to make it easier for people to find the right event quickly. Um, and then use it. Um, David's giving the talk at the same time, but I highly recommend that you check out his open source project. Um, David Boyne created this called the Event Catalog. Um, it's an open source project that you can install in your own um, environment. And it has these goals, right? It is a easy place for you to document your event schemas, to be able to discover them based on search or tags or categorizations. Um, and then it has some really nice visualizations as well. So David is an excellent um, front-end developer and, and tool developer with a, with a really keen uh, developer per, um, perspective on what developers need out of their tooling. Um, and so I, I encourage you to check this out. It's a great way to get started, very easy to get started as well in this space if you're not already using some sort of event catalog. Okay, so we found the event that we want. Now we want to subscribe to that event. Now the subscription to the event um, can be very, easy, like as James was saying, we wanna create a world where it's very self-service, people can come just find the events they want, consume them, um, but that's not true for all event types. So we might have event types with some metadata which are some, somewhat sensitive, right? So we talked about the contact information and, and um, uh, carbon, uh, carbon uh, information. Access to that information might be gated. It may not be a self-service way. So it, oftentimes in metadata catalogs, it's useful for there to be some sort of access management that you might need to go through and get approval to, to access those. So hopefully in most organizations, this is very easy for people to do in a self-service way, um, but uh, you can also introduce some access control here as well. Okay, so we've subscribed to the event. Now we wanna validate what's on the event. You might ask yourself like, well, we already validated the event in the producer. Why are we having to validate it a second time? Um, and we're validating it for a different reason on the consumer side. It's based on the context of what's actually in the event, not the correctness of what the schema was that's important to a consumer. So a consumer wants to check for a couple things. Is the event valid, right? Are the fields that are required for that consumer's context there? Um, are the fields accurate to that use case? And is the data timely? Is it coming in a time that makes sense for that consumer? So uh, oftentimes another metadata field I'll see added is a TTL value on the data um, timeliness, right? So the producer can say, you know, you should treat this data as uh, correct up to this certain period of time. So an example might be stock ticker information, right? I mean, the information is only good for a very short period of time. And so a consumer can skip processing that event if they're past that time. Why can things get out of sync? Well, there could be uh, data supply chain issues, right, where events are delayed. We can have infrastructure issues why those are delayed. We can also have replay events, though, where we're doing reconciliation and resending events, and some consumers may want to skip events if they don't make sense for their context. 
So here's a good example. We have beans that are being registered. We have all of the information that we've discussed except the carbon emissions. So the data is, it's legit. Like this information is useful, but not to all consumers. So we might have a sales organization where we want to put these new coffee beans available for purchase on a menu. We might have a marketing organization wants to put it in newsletter and make it visible to more people. And it doesn't matter if the carbon emissions are not included or not. But we also might be reporting, uh, creating a report for our board around our, our uh, carbon reporting. And because that information isn't there, we don't want to include it in that report, right? So we're, we're still validating things with the consumer, but we're validating them for things that are based on if that event, actual event that we're receiving is fit for use for that particular use case. Great, so this is completing the picture, right? So we've introduced these pieces one by one. You don't have to introduce them all together. Um, but you can see like regardless of the size of your organization and what you're doing, you need to think through these problems um, that you have, especially as things start simply, you don't have these problems, but they grow. Um, unless you have sort of governance in place, you'll very quickly get into an area where you have to, it's difficult to pull things back into your organization. Um, and once we have all of these pieces in place, this really kind of gets us to some of the more business focused things around observability. So lastly, we can have an observer on the router or the channel where these events are, are going through and we can store those in event storage. Um, and this really unlocks additional business governance, right? So we can do things like troubleshoot the events that are moving through the architecture, overall architecture. So there's a common place that we can search and discover those events and, and ask questions of what happened. This is a great place to do security and auditing of those events. Um, and then lastly, we can, there's a lot of data, right? This is a great place to drive analytics, not just for um, reporting, but also to drive AI models and other you know, predictive systems. Um, so you know, ultimately, once you kind of have these foundational pieces in place, then you can really look at more of your business-focused governance goals and apply those to the, the system. So I just want to stress that governance is for everyone, right? This, you don't have to apply all of these strategies or, or take all of them, but hopefully there are one or two things here that resonate with you and your use of event-driven architectures. You don't have to adopt all of these things at once. And I recommend starting with the data catalog, then looking at how you can do some standardization early on of, of certain key fields. Think about how you do producer and consumer validation. And then lastly, pull in the observability piece to it to the end and how you can sort of get that business governance context. Um, so that's it. If you have any questions, I'll be around all day. This is my email address. And um, please don't forget to vote for the session. So thanks so much for coming. Really appreciate your time. Thanks. <laughs>